Our guest today first assumed his position as commissioner six years ago this month. He assumed the chairmanship two years ago this month, being appointed by Governor Blagojevich. Our guest today was appointed to a second term, which expires in 2009, as I mentioned by Governor Blagojevich. He received a Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration, also from Marquette University, and his law degree from the John Marshall Law School. Our guest today is a Democrat, born and raised in Chicago, where he continues to reside. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the City Club of Chicago, the Chairman of the Interstate Commerce Commission, Ed Hurley. Edward. Jay did it again. It's part of my speech. I'm the chairman of the Illinois Commerce Commission, but I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, <laughs> you, you, I, well, I'll, t I'll touch on that. And by the way, the, two, the 2009 that I'm here till 2009, I will never, ever make it. Carrie Heitman is taking all the life out of me. <laughs> Along with a few others, I might add. Good afternoon. I am, uh, I, I should say that my prepared remarks suggest, uh, prepared by my two very able executive assistants, Michelle Michou and Carrie Lofton, who have joined us today, suggest that I tell you all how, that I am delighted, of course, to be here at the City Club. The reality is I am somewhat in awe to be here at the City Club. In my position as the chairman of the Illinois Commerce Commission, Jay, I often get invited to speak to many groups, and when Jay asked me to come and speak to the City Club, I was quite taken aback. It is truly an honor for me. I consider myself just an Irish kid from the south side of Chicago, and I know there are a handful of you out there that are just like me, and you know how we can be when it comes to these kinds of things. But I am certainly among a very prominent group of Chicago executives, as well as my fellow commissioners, who I will mention shortly, and quite a lot of our staff at the ICC, and oddly enough, even a bunch of utility folks. So uh, I guess you could go figure. I am truly honored. Thank you so much. And of course, my biggest fear when Jay did ask me to speak at one of these lunches, and he asked me quite some time ago, is that no one would come to the luncheon. So I want to thank you all for proving me wrong. Um, I have to touch on Jay again. Jay does, as we all know, uh, for those of us, I'm also a member of the City Club, so I come here a lot. Jay does such a great job here, and he is always so kind to me and makes a point of introducing me when I am here for lunch, usually as he did today as the chairman of the Interstate Commerce Commission. <laughs> which arguably would be somewhat of a promotion if indeed the Interstate Commerce Commission even existed any longer. <laughs> However, I always attribute this simply to what I go through as well, and that is senior moments from time to time. And I suspect, because Jay and I went to Marquette together, that we are in and around the same age group, I believe we are. And uh, I have to tell you that I, I met Jay when we were freshmen at Marquette. Now, what I remember well about him is this. First of all, you must consider the weather in Milwaukee a tad colder than Chicago. And most students, particularly freshman students, wore, you know, in those days, jeans, down parkas, and desert boots. But not Jay. Jay was the guy who walked Wisconsin Avenue as a freshman in gray flannel trousers, a tie, wingtip shoes, and a long camel-haired coat, and carried under his arm a copy of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> no book bag, a copy of the Wall Street Journal. I remember it well, and you know, as I look at him today and see all he's uh, accomplished, he really looks just like he did back in 1972. <laughs> what I want to what I'd like to do now is <clears throat> give you a sense of the Illinois Commerce Commission's responsibilities and how we conduct business 
the attorneys in the room may appreciate the fact that in 1877, the United States Supreme Court, in a case known as Munn versus Illinois, came out and basically set the premise for public utility rate regulation. Illinois, in those days, didn't do much with that, didn't assert much authority over public utilities at the time of the ruling, but public utilities were indeed uh, becoming very powerful, particularly the railroad industry. And in an effort to rein in this monopolistic behavior, if you will, the Illinois Commerce Commission was founded and formed by the General Assembly in 1914. Today, the ICC regulates public utilities to the extent that we have regulatory authority over electricity, natural gas, telecommunications, water and sewer, and some people don't know that, in fact, investor-owned water and sewer companies, and to, some de and to some degree, railroads, private towing companies, and interstate moving companies, that's household moving companies. The degree of ICC oversight <coughs> for each of the industry varies according to the interplay, of course, between state and federal laws. A lot of these, of course, have, we have the FERC and we have the FCC and uh, the, the railroads have some federal authority, federal uh, regulatory as well. So while we generally, the, the commission is responsible for setting rates for uh, traditional utility service, we hear complaints against utility companies, we promulgate rules for utilities, <clears throat> and, the interesting and the interested parties to live by. We approve tariffs and we certify alternative service suppliers, which has become uh, a much more active thing now. In addition to our daily duties, we often take on special projects, sometimes via a legislative mandate and sometimes in what I like to think are our own attempts to just stay ahead of the game, particularly on the national front. Um, and uh, in our spare time, we often like to use our statutory authority to approve or disapprove of multi-million dollar mergers and acquisitions. And I just looked over that way. I'm trying not to look at that end of the room because Carrie Heitman is shooting me that evil eye for comments I've made publicly recently about SBC's acquisition of AT&T. So I'm sticking to my friends at the ICC on this side of the room. Among regulatory circles, the ICC has a reputation of being a leader uh, on many fronts, particularly, especially in the telecommunications and electricity area. This has been the case for many years now. I get to take credit for a lot of it that I'm the chairman, but I have to admit I've known the commission for a long time, followed it for a long time, and a lot of folks were way ahead of me in giving us this reputation. I am only hopeful that I can continue down that path. I want to uh, step into electric mode for a moment. <clears throat> Back in 1997, the General Assembly in Illinois enacted landmark legislation to restructure the electric industry. Illinois is currently in the middle of transitioning from traditional rate of return, or if you will, monopolistic electric utilities, to an open retail market, meaning we have alternative energy suppliers that have an opportunity to procure power and energy for the end user, the end user of course being you and me. And, and then we have the utility still transmitting and delivering the power. While the General Assembly was eager to open the Illinois retail market, it was cautiously mindful that there were a lot of details to be worked out and did not want to set this system up for fail. As a result, the legislation used a gradual approach to open the markets, granting choice, as we call it, to one customer class at a time. And the General Assembly, in their infinite wisdom, which I think was a lot of wisdom, didn't stop there with the safeguards that they put into the act. All bundled, or, or as we call traditional service rates, have been and continue to be frozen until January 1st of 2007 with residential customers, and a lot of people forget this part of, uh, of the deal, Regi residential customers actually received a 20% reduction in their rates at the time of the promulgation of the legislation. We thankfully do not expect, have not, and do not expect 
to emulate the California experience here in Illinois. Uh, I was not around in 96. I have to tip my hat to those of you who were. Many are in this room um, who have helped to guide Illinois in the proper direction as we moved into this market. Um, you may be familiar with choosing alternative suppliers from a business perspective. The ICC has to date certified, and I think we just certified another one the other day, so now we're 17 alternative retail suppliers that are willing to serve commercial and industrial customers. No suppliers have come forward yet to serve residential customers yet. Um, I, 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 su I suspect that that will change once the rate caps come off at the end of 2006. Um, I used to be bothered by this fact. I used to call people up and say, why aren't you serving the residential class? Phil O'Connor's in the back of the room. Why aren't you serving the residential class? And there's no money in it. There's no money in it. But I have discovered that it's a national trend. And I am hopeful and hope springs eternal that soon residential customers will have some choice in the marketplace. Um, you may be wondering, I suppose, what it will happen in 2006. It's been suggested we're going to have the Armageddon of the electric industry. Will there be rolling blackouts, skyrocketing rates, utility bankruptcies? I think the answer is hardly. I like to suggest that you should never fear. We have mapped, the ICC has mapped a course of action in its efforts to ensure that the transition will be completely as smooth as possible. We have recognized the need for being proactive. We are not always, but this time I believe we have been. Uh, we've hosted a series of workshops last summer to discuss what we call the post-06 transition process. Participants, of whom there were many in these workshops, discussed over 80 critical and complex issues and successfully reached consensus on a large number of those issues, proving, as I like to say, that it is not always necessary to use an adversarial process to achieve solutions to points of contention. The uh, process, I'm going to touch on it a little bit later too, has gone extremely well. <clears throat> Another hot topic in the electric side of the equation is regional transmission organizations. We call them RTOs and we call it RTO development. <clears throat> The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, commonly known as FERC, which governs wholesale electricity, strongly urges companies that own transmission lines, electric transmission lines, to belong to an RTO. The theory is that RTOs provide many benefits, the chief one being dispatching electricity over transmission wires in a so-called neutral fashion. I also hear it called transparent. I think the, I think the bottom line is fair. So a neutral fashion. I like to analogize the RTO to the air traffic controller. They're just moving electricity as opposed to airplanes. Several RTOs have been formed throughout the country, such as the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland RTO, more commonly known as PJM, and the Midwest Independent System Operator, which is commonly known as MISO. While the FERC strongly urges RTO participation, Illinois law requires all electric utilities to be members of an RTO. Commonwealth Edison recently, and actually not so recently, but last year, became a member of PJM. <clears throat> the Ameren companies, the downstate companies, which now include Illinois Power, are on schedule to become members of the MISO. There are delays. This is not unusual, as we saw with ComEd's integration into PJM. I know it is not necessarily a sexy topic, but we strongly believe that we'll be, we will see the elimination of the reliability problems of the past through the integration of these companies into RTOs. That is a good thing. I'd like to turn now to the subject of natural gas. <clears throat> there are definitely some interesting things going on. You've probably read in the newspapers about a couple of the cases the commission grapples with, uh, which I would love to discuss the details of, but the good news is I can't. And it's always, it is always so interesting how we employ the uh, Open Meetings Act and the ex parte uh, communication situation when it's convenient. Um, but in point of fact, uh, you probably know that uh, there are some rather controversial issues before the commission. 
And uh, I can say this, one of the Commission's duties and what is going on now is to conduct what we call prudence reviews of the gas purchased by natural gas utilities. If we find imprudence or what we believe are unreasonable gas purchases by the companies, we deny the costs associated with those purchases. And the bottom line is customers can ultimately receive a refund, sometimes large, sometimes small. We shall see. Um, I believe two of those very large cases will uh, come before the commission later this year. Uh, now I'm going to talk about gas costs because we are all aware of the high cost of natural gas. You've experienced it while heating your homes, while heating your businesses, and while there is a moratorium on natural gas shutoffs from December 1st until April 1st, many people are unable to afford to pay their gas bills during the moratorium and they face being turned off on April 1st. Fortunately, there are programs such as the Low Income Home Energy Assistant Assistance Program, which we finally call, we finally call, finally, finally call LIHEAP, and the Good Samaritan Initiative to provide assistance. The Department of Public Aid, not the Commission, administers the LIHEAP program, which gives grants for the purpose of paying energy bills to those who qualify. My friend, the Lieutenant Governor, Pat Quinn, and myself worked together with the, and I know some of you may find that odd, but we worked very well together, with the natural gas utilities to develop the Good Samaritan Initiative, which was the brainchild of Pat Quinn. This program allows LIHEAP eligible gas customers whose service was terminated prior to the start of the heating season to have service restored for $250 or 20% of their arrearages whichever is less. This, of course, is provided that the customer applies for the LIHEAP grant and participates in weatherization and conservation programs for their homes. Last winter, as part of this initiative, Commissioner Lula Ford and Commissioner O'Connell Diaz, in conjunction with several natural gas utilities, conducted community outreach pro programs to educate consumers about the LIHEAP program, their natural gas bills, and the importance of weatherization and conservation measures. Um, we have been very proud of them and the work that they have done and they continue to do was an area that I felt the commission was reacting to not being proactive and I believe we have solved that well. The Good Samaritan Initiative also serves as a tool to drum up support for the Good Samaritan Trust Fund, which will be used to provide further assistance for those who need it to pay those high heating bills. And let us not forget that all gas utilities have programs in place for their customers to participate in to help those in need alleviate some of the burden of what has happened in our world, and that is the high cost of natural gas. One of the things that I have learned is that the gas companies, for all the hits they take, are always willing to help customers that find themselves in difficult positions. The, uncollect uh, the uncollectibles for these companies are a huge problem. <clears throat> we've discovered that it is far better, or they've discovered and we've discovered, <clears throat> excuse me, it is far better to have customers turned on and participating in a payment program of some type than to have them not turned on at all. We all end up somehow paying for the uncollectibles. On the telecommunications side of the equation, of course, the industry, as I mentioned, is all somewhat abuzz with the announcement of SBC's intent to acquire AT&T. We at the Commission um, have asked for, and I'm sure will receive, we need a lot more information before we can make a determination as to what role, if any, the ICC will play in this potential example, if you will, of the child swallowing the parent. We don't know yet what will come of this, but there is one lesson already any parents out there, you better watch your back, at least if one of your children is SBC. More to come on that issue. What this points out, however, is what's been going on for a long time, and that is the ever-changing face of the telecom industry. A few years ago, many thought that the opening of the telecom market as a result of the 1996 Federal Telecom Act 
was going to lead us all to a higher plane of existence. I think a few stockbrokers might have made it there during the resulting boom, but the rest of us are still here, which has led some to disappointment and hand-wringing. Many are concerned that the disappearance of some of the old companies means the era of competition must be over. However, I believe that the market is becoming more and more competitive all the time and will continue to do so. The total number of wireless minutes used last year surpassed the total number of wireline minutes. Many young people, and I suppose some of us in this room, do not, although I think there's a few young people here, do not even have a wireline phone any longer. Voice over IP, which some call VoIP, voice over IP protocol, companies such as Vonage have hundreds of thousands of customers and are adding more every month. Cable companies are starting to jump into the voice market in a big way. While these companies are adding lines every month, the traditional wireline companies have been losing lines for the last couple of years. So although competition did not develop the way many thought it would, I believe the coming years look better than ever for the technolo technological improvements that we've seen and hence, in my opinion, further savings for consumers because that's where it all leads. Additionally, on the telecom front, the hot topic this spring is the possible rewrite of the Illinois Telecommunications Act. Senator Sullivan served actively on the last rewrite and I assume will be involved in this one too as he takes a great interest in telecommunications as Jay mentioned. Um, the act will sunset at the end of June I would, I would suggest and continue to suggest that it's rather difficult to do a major rewrite at this point given that the rules and the regulations coming out of the FCC have been slow in coming, muddled, and inevitably end up in court. So far there has been more heat than light coming from the lobbyists in Springfield, but we will see what the coming months will bring and we should probably know something fairly soon. The AT&T acquisition while it's barely begun, will certainly change the scene in Springfield from what we saw the last time. I don't know if AT&T and competitive carriers will be out there hanging me in effigy this time around, since they'll be busy uh, in their boardrooms filing papers for a possible mergers. But, but it should be rather interesting. And uh, now I'd like to turn to a subject that doesn't really generate much publicity, and that is the water and sewer industries. Several large investor-owned utilities and many mom and pop operations supply water and sewer services in Illinois, and many of you didn't know we have regulatory and rate authority over these companies. What's happened, larger utilities tend to serve the urban areas, while the smaller shops tend to serve very small rural areas, some of these only serving a small housing subdivision or perhaps a mobile home park. We've seen a trend in Illinois and nationally where the larger utilities are acquiring the smaller operations. This is a good thing, a very beneficial thing for several reasons. Customers of the smaller system see lower bills as the, re as the result of economies of scale, and the larger utilities have the resources to make the necessary improvements to the aging infrastructure, as well as ensuring that these systems are in compliance with environmental regulations. Added resources are also important for the safekeeping of the water system in light of terrorist threats of contamination to the water supply, an issue the Commission takes extremely <laughs> seriously. To a certain degree, the Commission regulates aspects of the transportation industry. The General Assembly charged the Commission with the administration of the Grade Crossing Protection Fund which is used to make improvements for the public safety at railroad crossings. Such improvements often include, but are not limited to, installing automatic warning devices and constructing new crossing surfaces. It's a very interesting, but not highly publicized area of what we do. We work very closely with the railroads, and we work well with the railroads these days, and municipalities, to make grade crossings safer. If any of you live near a railroad crossing, <coughs> and many of us who live on the south side or came from the south side all live near railroad crossings. You're probably familiar with trains blowing whistles when approaching these crossings. Last summer, the Illinois Commerce Commission administered funds that were granted to Representative Kevin Joyce uh, to install special gates at certain crossings in residential areas, specifically the Beverly neighborhoods. And 
what has happened out there is for years and years and years, the train whistles have been blowing and driving everybody crazy. Now they have very safe gates in that area and they no longer need to sound their whistles. And the initiative met with a tremendous amount of approval and applause from uh, these old Chicago neighborhoods. I happened to go out there with Kevin Joyce and some folks from the ICC and everybody was very, very pleased. So it's working out well, but it's a, you know, again, it's a dangerous area. It's, it is railroad crossings. And while they don't want the whistles blowing all the time, they want the safety measures that go with it. And I mean, you know, a lot of us spend time down in Springfield and the whistle blowing is very annoying. Very <laughs> particularly if you stay at that hotel that's right on the train tracks. I stayed there once, Lord. Just briefly, I'd like to mention that the commission is also responsible for licensing private towing companies, as well as setting towing fees and licensing interstate commercial and household goods movers. I know this sounds boring, until you get your car towed or your movers lose your furniture, then it's not so boring and it happens a lot and you know me now, and you'll probably be calling me to tell me about it, and I will take care of it. I want to digress a bit now and talk about the makeup of the commission. And while it would be nice if the chairman alone had the sole authority to make all decisions, I, said, I would suspect it would be a rather short-term job. Um, in point of fact, we five of us make the decisions in a group fashion. First and foremost, the commissioners who are appointed by the governor to five-year terms, I want you all to know, are incredibly intelligent, established, and capable people. If you can't tell from my colorful use and complimentary adjectives, they are here. <laughs> Though our backgrounds are diverse, they serve us very well in our deliberations, and I believe we each bring something unique to the bench. I specifically asked Jay not to introduce the commissioners when he was introducing notable personages here because I wanted to do it myself. First, Commissioner Ford. Lula, just let people know who you are. Let's hold the applause till the end. It interrupts my train of thought. <laughs> Commissioner Ford comes from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. She put herself through school, achieving a master's degree and still struggling with a PhD, I believe. She raised a daughter on her own and raised her well, I might add. She is a distinguished educator, having worked in the Chicago public school system for 34 years and lives to tell the tale as a teacher and a principal and having finished her work there working directly for the Board of Education. Commissioner Ford joined the Commerce Commission soon after Governor Blagojevich took office. Since joining the commission, she has assumed the chair of the commission's Gas Policy Committee. She has become a board member of the American Gas Association and most recently was tapped to, to participate on the board of directors of the organization of PJM States, one of the RTOs that I mentioned earlier that, into, that Commonwealth Edison integrated into. Lula brings fresh ideas and, and an absolutely no-nonsense approach to our deliberations. And I like to say about her, she does not suffer fools easily. Commissioner Aaron O'Connell Diaz. is a well-known face at the ICC. She brings a wealth of knowledge to her office, having spent 12 years as an administrative law judge at the commission. I have known Aaron since, uh, there's another AG for you, I've known Aaron since we were baby lawyers in the Attorney General's office. Because of her experience, I knew that she was the appropriate person to spearhead the post-2006 transition process that I discussed earlier. Commissioner O'Connell Diaz also works with the United States Department of Energy in developing a relationship with Brazil's equivalent of the Public Utilities Commission. Aaron's history at the commission brings an invaluable tool to our work, and I always count on her when I don't feel like taking on the project myself. <laughs> she continues, she started out doing an excellent job and continues to do a great job 
with the current state of the electric transition process. And I'm sure that we will all be better served because of her service on this issue. Commissioner Kevin Wright. Where is he? A lot of people know Kevin because he has been in important roles in state governor in state government rather for what seems like forever, and I know he would agree with that. In fact, he was even the chairman of the Commerce Commission, perhaps the shortest lived chairman of the Commerce Commission prior to my being named chair. But um, Commissioner Wright is the ICC's point person for RTO development matters and works closely with the MISO now. Additionally, he now serves as the president of the organization of MISO states. I, I, I always like to say when he was the chair, I met with him when he first was named the chair and I told him I'm going to treat you very well while you are the chair and I expect the same because I'm going to be the next chair and for the most part it works. Kevin is a stickler for protocol. I am not, hence he keeps me well informed on, very well informed I should add, on how things should function and how things should look. He is the commissioner that I publicly torture the most. And he takes it very, very well. Kevin is a gentleman in every sense of the word. Commissioner Lieberman, who I continue to welcome and welcome and welcome. <laughs> Commissioner Bob Lieberman started 10 days ago. But he brings over 25 years of experience in economic and energy policy to his new role at the ICC. Prior to his appointment, Bob served as the CEO of the Center for Neighborhood Technology, where he developed innovative ecological and economic strategies for urban regions throughout the United States. During his tenure at the center, he developed and implemented a series of creative strategies to expand public access to technology and increase neighborhood energy efficiency, including the Energy Smart Pricing Program, which saves its participants 15 to 20 percent off their electric bills by giving them access to market prices. And when I heard about this is when I got to re-meet Bob and asked uh, he and Kathy Tholen from the center to come over and teach me something. I am, for one, very excited about, uh, the, about the experience that Bob is bringing to the ICC. I truly believe that with Bob's help, we can expand Illinois' reputation as a leader by developing demand-side management programs in the electric industry. Governor Blagojevich spoke to this issue in his State of the State address last week. We will be advancing, prog we will be advancing those programs at the ICC, and it is clear that Bob Lieberman's experience will be extremely useful in developing and implementing these programs. I welcomed him yet again last night and said it was about the eighth time. This is it. You're here, welcome. <laughs> We are very pleased to have you. I am and consider myself very privileged indeed to work with a high caliber group of people like I've just introduced to you. Two Illinois governors, I believe, made excellent choices when filling vacancies, ensuring, as the statute suggests, ideological diversity. <clears throat> Each commissioner today takes his or her job very seriously, so much so that independent of commission duties, we all participate in national organizations. I cannot stress enough the synergy under which the commission operates. Our decision making is thoughtful, immediate, and decisive, and I fully expect that to continue now that we have a full complement of commissioners. The five commissioners, however, do not do this alone. The ICC employs a full complement of staff, including but not limited to attorneys, accountants, and economists, I know all of the commissioners are very appreciative of the invaluable work the ICC staff does in helping us reach these difficult decisions that we have to make. I would, of course, be remiss if I did not make mention of and compliment Scott Wiseman, our executive director, who operates. Where is he? Where is he? Right there, right in front of you, the bald guy over there. He is our executive director. He also operates as chief of staff. We are very fortunate indeed to have him in that role. He is a man who somehow is able to deal with the unfortunate circumstance of pleasing five bosses. Think about that one. Five very different bosses. 
on the personal front, we are the commission, or the personal as a chairman of the ICC, we are frequently criticized, primarily in the media, some of us more than others, for not being responsive to consumers' needs. This is often captured by the term pro-utility. I used to resent this and think it was incredibly unfair, but I have matured in the job. I like to pose this question once in a while. If the commission is so utility friendly, then why do the, why do the utilities go to the legislature in attempts to do end runs around the commission's authority? There's one for you, I'm not going to answer it today. But while I would love to talk about recent legislative initiatives, today is not the day for that either. I only, I don't have the time. <laughs> I would need several hours. What I really would like to stress, and the take home message to you at the City Club, if you will, is that the law under which the ICC operates requires us to balance interests when rendering our decisions. When we are presented with an issue, we must take into account everyone's point of view, the utilities, the utility competitors, and the consumers. Not only must the commission protect the consumer from high rates, we must also protect, which is often overlooked, the utility's financial health. Financially healthy companies may secure capital less expensively, which consequently leads to lower utility rates. We are very concerned about the consumer's rates, and we are concerned about utility financial viability. Our detractors and critics continually fail to, re to consider both sides of this equation. You know, it's easy to make you afraid of it and tell you who it is to blame for it. However, I believe it takes serious people to solve these serious issues. I am hopeful that you believe that those of us who are here doing this job now can do that job on your behalf. Thanks so much for coming and even more for listening. Line up for a few questions, and uh, we'll try and take a few. And just in case, I want to say, tie them. That's thank you very much. Uh, everything's an acronym. That's all we're going to talk from now on. Uh, but Joyce, as always, the uh, Alan Spivak of this organization. Carmen Hurley. I'm Joyce Sachs. Yes, and I'm Joyce. On the how are City you? Club. Thank oh. you. I'm speaking for Stella Black, who had to leave after your very fine speech. She noticed being <coughs> CPA that uh, there was a 99 cent charge on her residential AT&T phone bill and she couldn't get a satisfactory answer. It was for property tax. Do we gotta pay your property tax, AT&T? Where are those people from AT&T? <laughs> How dare they do that? You know, why don't you just have Stella call? I, I don't know what the 99 cent charge is, but uh, you know, we're, we are very- She did call. She got a lot of voicemails and no answer. <laughs> Moving we'll have on, somebody take on. a look at that. Oh, now, this, this, this will be high, much higher level. Sure. <laughs> Can I have a drink of water? Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs, Thanks. airing every Monday night at 8.30 on Cable Channel 21. This coming Monday night, Cook County President John Stroger, that is Cook County Board President John Stroger, defends his tax increases. Your proposed. question, sir. Ah. <laughs> Commissioner Hurley, yes, uh, this is, I guess is a one month, one month anniversary of a famous lunch or a celebrated lunch that's been much in the news. Your January 10th lunch at uh, Smith & Walensky, I guess a competitor of this restaurant, so we won't say too much about that. But uh, as you know, you were there with Commissioner Ford and two people's energy executives, or so we're told by the media and a third utility company employee. And although some people question, which you apparently deny, whether you discussed at that lunch business relating to the, uh, uh, the people's energy, uh, the issue of that cup raises that people's energy is, should be giving a refund. The more important point is I understand the open meeting, open meeting 
Act is that it requires an open meeting. That's the name of the law. When I, in this case, where you had four commissioners, two or more are meeting to discuss commission business. Isn't it commission business if you discuss, as apparently you agreed, uh, potential employment of an employee of People's Energy by the ICC? The, uh, well, the article of which you speak, and uh, it hasn't been going on that long. It was kind of a two-day story, by the way. But <clears throat> the... Um, uh, it was in the, the January 25th Sun-Times, 15 days later. Jeff, let him answer. <laughs> the, um, the question that was raised by the article was whether or not Lula and I did, in fact, violate the Open Meetings Act by having lunch and discussing what some suggested was state business. The lunch, the, the young gentleman that we were introduced to, we were not interviewing him it was simply a casual introduction of a young man in our efforts to uh, try to improve the diversity at the ICC, something I've been trying to do since I got there. And uh, how one could possibly conclude that a casual introduction of a young African-American gentleman to Lula and I is state business, I will leave that one to you. Has the Attorney General indicated whether she agrees with him? The Attorney General and the Inspector, the Governor's Inspector General have both spoken with Lula and myself. But has she indicated Jeff, whether she Jeff, agrees? Jeff, this is not a soliloquy. Thank you very much. Next question. Hi, Patricia DuPont, a nobody, just a person <laughs> asking a question, and I'm kind of directing it to AT&T. Are you getting uh, increasing reports of spamming and cramming, and how are you handling We are getting fewer decreasing reports of spamming and spam, spamming and what'd you call it? Cramming. And cramming. We are getting uh, fewer reports these days than in the past. I was sent a um, bill for $1,700 um, for calls made to El Salvador. Um, all of the calls were made to the same okay. number within a few minutes. But I haven't heard about that happening in some time. It really, I thought they had some control. You need to call me. I'll see that you get my card, and then I'll have somebody take Thank care you of you. Thank so much. Sure. Go ahead, Mike. Um, and, you know, since you said on the ICC during the Biden administration, now during the Gore Bush administration, I think we'd all be interested in hearing if you could comment on the difference in operating styles of uh, both administrations with a quasi-independent commission like the ICC. You know, it would be very difficult to comment on the styles of the administrations. I mean, while I have thoughts on the Biden administration and I have thoughts on the Blagojevich administration, the ICC clearly operates independent of the governor's office, and the governor's office uh, prefers to keep it that way, and uh, I think that is the way it should be. So I have no particular thoughts on the Ryan administration or the Blagojevich administration vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis being the chairman of the Illinois Commerce Commission. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Well, how about a big round of applause?